This episode is the third part of a three-part series. If you haven't yet, start with Children of the Intervention and then listen to the coppers. Also, it contains some strong language. Most of us have lived in these camps all our life. I've moved out, I've come back, grew up in Charles Creek. Mm. So um, you've got some kids of your own? Yep. What are your hopes and dreams for them? They've got brains, they do go to school all the time. Yeah. yeah, I've got my eldest daughter now who's almost finished year 12 and she's straight into her health workers course straight after school holidays and the other one's in year 10 and yeah, she's pr- pursuing what she wants to do now through the vet courses through school. I'm at Charles Creek Camp, just on the edge of Alice Springs. It's its own little community at the bottom of a hill. I'm talking to Renee. While we talk, her kids are playing nearby. Still in their uniforms, just home from school. They're burning off that last bit of energy before dinner and settling in for the night. I want to know what it's been like to live here, under the glaring spotlight of governments, but never to be seen, only monitored. To live a life within the ever-tightening parameters decided by the state. The latest one being the curfews imposed earlier this year. Kids weren't allowed on the streets after 6pm. That was horrible, like... I've just finished the season being an under 70s coach for the girls' side into Alice. Um, it was a bit hard because we had to bring our training times earlier just so the kids could be home before the certain time, which was silly because none of my girls was involved with any of the rubbish that was going on around town and they, it really affected our training ways. So, yeah, it was pretty stupid that we got affected from it really bad. Is that it's kind of the typical thing that happens in the territory is that everyone gets tarred with the same brush because, um, you know, a certain number of people are playing up and then everyone has to suffer as a result? Is that the way you feel? Yep, exactly the way I feel. It's, you know, it's not our problem. It should be brought upon their guardians, their parents or whatever with whoever's doing wrong. Yeah. And so no one's talking to each other. I mean, that's what it seems to me. No one's actually... You can sort of like enforce the law, you can bring in curfews, you can bring in the interventions through the army and stuff, but actually no one's actually sitting down and talking with people to find out what the problem is and what the solution is. Yeah, that'd be right if we could do that, but no one's game enough to get out and talk about it, so yeah. It must be pretty exhausting. Yeah, it is. Being locals and lived here all our life, so yeah. Do you see a long-term future here for yourself and your family? At the moment, no. So where would you go? Somewhere out of Alice Springs, hopefully. It's not so much the crime wave that's driving Renee out of Alice Springs. It's been the response to it. People who are trying their best are looked on with suspicion. It's tiring having to prove yourself time and time again to do the little things. Go to the shops, drive a car, raise a family. Every Aboriginal person here is under the same pressure. The thing that needs fixing is not Renee or her family, but the continual trespassing on their lives by clerks and coppers. She's not alone wanting to leave Alice. Those who can afford it are packing up and leaving. There are for sale signs everywhere you go in town. There's a glut of homes on the market. So what are the people that remain want? What's working or needs to happen to make things work? The little things that can make a big difference. I'm Daniel James from Schwartz Media and 7am. This is Alice Springs. Episode 3, in Bartway. everyone. What an incredible group of dedicated, hard-working Territorians. How good is it to be Territorian tonight? There's a new government in the Territory, and its leader has promised solutions. Earlier this year, Leah Finicchiaro became the new Chief Minister of the Northern Territory. She won in a landslide, almost completely wiping out the Labor Party from Parliament reinstalling the country Liberal Party to power. 
as a born and bred second generation Territory kid, the granddaughter of Italian migrants. I grew up living an iconic Territory childhood, hunting, camping, fishing and playing outside. I always knew the Territory was a special place and I was lucky to be a Territorian. Growing up here... The new Chief Minister's just turned 40, but she's been in Parliament for 13 years. She's CLP through and through, as much a part of the political establishment as you can get here. The dawn of this era looks strangely like the old one. It's another Territorian looking back at this place as they remember. To get back to those times, the new Chief Minister will be implementing her tough-on-crime agenda. Territorians have stood up against nearly two decades of escalating crime an economy going backwards, and the erosion of our once iconic lifestyle. But tomorrow is the start of a new day and a new chapter. She's promised to lower the age of criminal responsibility to 10, tightening already tight bail laws. Schools will have truancy officers, and there's the threat to restrict government benefits for parents of kids who misbehave. Police will be given more powers to search kids as young as 10 if they're considered suspicious, the greyest of law enforcement criteria. Spit hoods, banned after the Dondale Royal Commission, will be back. The prison itself, in the midst of a makeover, new and improved to house all the incarcerated children to come. CLP are proposing on the issue of youth crime to reducing the age of criminal responsibility back to 10 from 12 years of age. Yes. What experts have said that this is a good idea and what have they said? Well, the experts that the CLP listen to are the everyday Territorians who are out there sick and tired of being victims of crime. We had hollow promises from Chancellor... So they're her solutions, but what about the locals? Before we came to Alice Springs, we called a lot of people. Elders, lawyers, health workers. A lot of people who have been fighting over decades to try and improve the plight of people living here. Blair McFarlane's name kept on coming up. So we set up a meeting with him. We meet him at the Olive Pink Botanical Gardens. They're desert gardens, nestled at the base of one of the hills of the eastern McDonnell Ranges. The sky is blue and the morning sun is warm. Hey, Blair. How are you going? After decades of work on the front line, he's approaching retirement and is at the point where he can tell it like it is. Call out anyone or any agency that needs to be called out. Yes, I'm Blair McFarland. Um, uh, one of my uh, things is that I'm 2024 NT Australian of the Year. I say that so, you know, sort of I've got a little bit of generally sort of acknowledged cred in case you've never heard of me, which of course the vast majority will never have. Blair arrived here in the mid 80s from Melbourne and fell in love with the place and the people. Petrol sniffing was a sporadic problem when he arrived, but by the start of the new millennium, the problem became more and more prevalent until it turned into an unrelenting wave with no sign of stopping. It's an issue that's plagued remote Indigenous communities for decades and its effects are devastating. Petrol sniffing is on the rise in the top end... In 2002, Blair established the Central Australian Youth Link-Up Service, CALIS, to support young people sniffing petrol. Blair himself had first-hand encounters with people who'd attempted suicide as a result of sniffing. One man he saved went on to save another from a similar attempt. Blair McFarland is the manager of Kalis. He's speaking with Cathy Van Extel. And so the youth are roaming around with a real feeling of, like, nobody cares about us. It's definitely contributed to a feeling of unease on the street in Alice Springs. Like, the, a lot of people are really concerned about it. Like, they're nice kids, but they roam around... At- Through Kalis, he advocated for the Low Aromatic Fuel Act in 2013, which resulted in a 95% drop in petrol sniffing. It was as close as you could get to ever solving a complex problem in this part of the world. But this is different. This crisis is much worse. It's uh, really quite different because basically a petrol sniffer is like a zombie. You know, they sort of, they stumble around, they've got a can against their face, they, they don't seem to see anything. So that's what it was like then. And they were doing themselves serious damage. The now is really contrasty to that. Which is, and... The now is a bunch of kids with ADHD, FASD, global developmental delay. They're hungry, they're wired, they're sort of off, their traditional authority systems have been undermined by colonisation for generations. 
and this is what Alice Springs is now facing the, the you know the karma that we're we're facing because of policy decisions made a generation ago. But no one in politics is talking about that. It seems like they're only thinking as far ahead as the next electoral cycle will allow. I think that there are so many players here operating their own, on their own agendas that it's actually uh, what a mathematician would call a chaos field, a field where there are so many decisions being made that it's really unpredictable in which direction things will go. And that's, I think, what you're feeling here. There is no plan. Like, you know, the, the crime stuff, they're saying, oh, we'll put everybody in jail. So, like... Is that the plan, that everybody in the Northern Territory will either be a prisoner or a warden by the year 2050? Uh, lowering the age of criminal responsibility back to 10. I know, what they should do six. That'd be more fun. <laughs> That's just crazy. What do you got to say about it? Oh, it's, just, just, it's a crazy, desperate, foolish thing that in no way affects, you know, what's making those kids criminal. Um If they wanted to do something about that whole scene, you'd put a lot more resources into diagnosing and treating all of those those things. His view echoes experts who say not only does tough on crime not work, it's a potential breach of human rights. When it comes to kids in prison or detention or whatever you want to call it, what the state's doing is swapping one culture for another, one where the cycle of crime and punishment becomes the norm. Throwing children in detention and placing them in previously banned spit hoods can and will have psychological and cognitive impacts on kids' development. Even though the strategies won't work, people have lost hope to fight against them. This is the mandate the government has, despite less than 45% of enrolled voters in bush electorates casting a ballot. Blair says the low voter turnout is linked to the outcome of the voice referendum as well. You know, I think yeah, the referendum made Aboriginal people even more cynical than before about what's the point, because I think a whole lot of Aboriginal people became really dis, dis uh, enheartened about the whole voting thing and didn't vote. Like in the electorate I ran in, there, there were 6,500 people registered to vote and 2,500 voted. Blair ran as a Greens candidate in the recent election and lost. Greens are a rare breed in the Territory. Perhaps his last attempt to force change in Alice Springs and beyond. So Blair, what needs to be done? I don't know what, I don't know. I've tried, I've tried everything, I, nothing, nothing works. Blair contributed a lot, more than most. But ultimately, change here is going to come from somewhere else. After the break, one man and his family in the middle of the desert trying their best to help the children of Imbantwa break the cycle. It means Ruby and I are going on country. These are the biggest horses you've ever seen. Melbourne Recital Centre celebrates 15 years of living and breathing live music with performances by local powerhouses and international stars. Melbourne Recital Centre, where live music lives. Explore the program at melbournerecital.com.au So we seen an the other day just over there. Oh, yeah. Running around, we just picked up a baby printy about that big. His head was stuck on a can. So we're surrounded, I mean, can you describe where we are? I mean, we're surrounded by rocky escarpments with McDonald yeah, Ranges east, east. East of McDonald Ranges, I think. Yeah. This is the Ondulia side of the Mbanta country. Mm-hmm. And um, over here, there's a great significance of um, connection to this country. That's mm-hmm. the three caterpillars. And yep. Jalka is my great, great, great grandfather. Right. And he's not too far from here. We've come here at a cracking time of day, late afternoon. The sun low over the McDonald Ranges on the horizon. I'm with Damien, the fellow who's been our unofficial tour guide. We're out at his favourite place, the place where he tries to make a difference to what's happening here. His generosity helped us a great deal for this series. But now we're at his outstation, the spot that made us want to speak with him in the first place. 
all, all what you see is what I've accumulated out of my own pocket. This but, old machine here, I've only bought that cheap, but it's done in me some, you know, some world of greatness. Did, um, There's caravans for Smoko and to shelter from the weather. There's fences, gates and pens. And there's horses. What's this fella's name? This is Malin. She's a mare. That's right. Yeah. That's right. How much I know about horses. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's ammo. Melon, chopsticks. This is Mo, my big horse. He's a big fella. How yeah, many hands is 16, he? 16 hands. Oh, that's big fella, yeah. And the other one, so, other side of him is DJ, and that's Grim up the back. I reckon um, that's the biggest horse I've ever seen in my life. He's the most gentlest one. Yeah, right. Um, he's raced all the... Emma, Mallon and Chopsticks are looked after by kids who come here from town. Kids who've spent time in detention or kids with substance issues. Damien calls the program All Rounder. I've got a young bloke that I'm training, Justin, and uh, he's um, getting ready to race again, so he's probably going to race Chopstick or this big fella here. So we'd get kids out here, numbers of 30, 29, different... Different young fellas, different ages. We could either be doing identifying bush medicine or trees to make bush tools out of. Um, we do a, a, what do you call it, a cultural conversation. Half of the group might want to do the horses, like um, brush them down, and we get the other half preparing the saddle. Yeah. And then we'll switch, so they both get two learning sessions out of the one day. Yep. And that could be the mechanics, or that could be the fencing, or that could be the cooking, or the artwork, or the fitness style, side of things. So we break it down for the one day, but split it in twos. So by the time the kids have come through the program, what, um, what will they know how to do that they didn't know how to do before they got here? Well, here's the thing. Um, when you talk about pioneering days, everything was built on how much skills you had and how, um, how useful you could be on country. So we tried to give them all those skills. So if a job presented itself, they'd be trained in multiple ways. So a job wouldn't sort of um, cause them any fear to mm. apply for one or, but we normally aim to explore their talents and expose that talent and push them into that sort of workforce because then they'll stick at it because they love doing it. So we do, uh, you know, all sorts of stuff. Welding, fencing, mechanics, cooking, artwork, horsemanship. I, I believe, from what I've seen, I've seen a lot of change. I've seen a chemical here that actually works. What's that chemical? The chemical is back on country. Yeah, right. And just being at peace with country and animals, it gives a different approach when you're trying to uh, educate someone or talk to someone they have the time to take it in. Mm. All Rounder is a working work in progress, and Damien's reasons for starting the program are deep. From the origin behind it is my dad, he was um, uh, a cattleman and a person before him. Grew up in a home, starting generation, very resilient. Um, yeah, took on different skill set, because that's what was required back in the day. Yep. As a kid, Damien's dad, Dennis, was forcibly removed from his family and sent to Darwin. Somehow he escaped and returned to his country where he became a ringer on a cattle station. Through years of skilled and hard toil, he went on to become one of the first Aboriginal owners of a cattle station. I've seen footage of Dennis. Damien looks and sounds just like him. Yeah, I was raised in out bush on a cattle, like on cattle stations, seeing my dad doing it. Um, but to be creative was the key for me. Mm -hmm. In life, Damien, like many of us do, worked a series of jobs, many of them a long way from his true passion, but in aid of his people nonetheless. What were you doing before you, you started the program? I was um, an officer at a, a bailing facility called Saltbush, and we was trying to you know, keep him from not getting locked up and keep him from coming back. And then I heard about these other programs that's being delivered, but these kids were still reoffending. But they was receiving so much funding every year. And I, I come to think about it, I, what, where's all this money going? Because there's a lot of money getting chucked around, but there's no change. So I created an idea 
For my program, that was based on my dad's upbringing from his pioneering days. To find the path forward, not only for himself, but his community, Damien would be guided from within. He could look to his own flesh and blood for the trail out of the mess. He would look to his own father. Dennis passed away a couple of years ago, but his name and memory live on. Damien has called the land we're on RDK Outstation after his old man, Roy Dennis Kunoth. It means that every kid that gets a helping hand here will have Dennis to thank as much as Damien. He believes that small black run and owned programs like this can help kids heal, reorientate their lives and help them in a way that locking them up never will. I don't think there's too many programs like mine. I think it's pretty unique how it's designed and where the origin comes from. Uh, yeah, I've, so I've done a little bit of work. Most of my work's been pretty good. I'd like to expand. I'd like to have young people out here full time, just caretaking for the animals and getting a wage at some point in time. Eventually I want to run a little bit of cattle. I can introduce that cattle industry back in, you know, to these young people's lives, giving them an opportunity to chase cattle in the yard, brand them and mark them and just teach them a bunch of skills to be uh, self-sufficient back on their own country. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a lot of programs, like I was saying, they get a lot of funding, but there's no real outcome. I'd like to be the first that could create outcomes before I receive any type of funding. I was mesmerised by the setting and what Damien was doing. But there was one question I was dreading. Would you like to go for a ride on, sir? Not a chance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, Let uh, me stop you right there. I mean, It's not that I'm not a fan of horses. It's that I fear that they won't be a fan of me. Damien's son, Bison, is of a similar mindset. He's been with us all day, but he's quiet and shy, especially around the animals. I'm second. Do you ride, uh, do you ride any of them, Bison? Uh, I don't know for animals. <laughs> yeah, he, um, he read my big one that was last year. Yeah, this bloke lives up in Darwin. Yeah, yeah. But he occasionally comes down and visit, check out what I'm doing, check out the program's doing, so. Bison's 18, but he's a young 18. Despite his shyness, he's been warm and friendly with us and has a dry sense of humour, well aware of his surroundings and mindful of what he has to say. What's it, um, what's it like living in Alice Springs? It's a little bit messed up here and there. You're 18? Yeah. And what do you want to do with your life from here? I haven't got to that point yet. <laughs> yeah. It's a big question, isn't it? Yeah. What about what your old man does? Nah. Nah. I don't know, to ride horses and stuff. <laughs> you feel lucky that you've got someone like your dad as a, as a role model that's kind of, you know, been a bit of a beacon for, yeah. for you and your siblings? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. In my mind, Bison was an example of a kid on the right path. If he played his cards right, he could stay at arm's distance from the system avoid becoming hoovered up by it and part of the cycle. He has a loving family, his dad's a local leader and a role model. The outstation is an oasis in a desert of disarray, somewhere where you can point to the chaos elsewhere and know from where you stand you can keep it at bay. I thought he was one of the lucky ones, but it's wrong to assume anything about this place. Ruby, Bison and I were sitting in the car when we started chatting. At first, just small talk about life at the station. One time I, I came here, because my dad was forcing me to like come leave water and for the horses and that, you know? Yep. But I took the wrong track. And I just got stuck. Oh shit. <laughs> on the other road. But as we drove yeah. on, Bison started telling me something that complicated all that. So when were you up in Darwin? I was coming back Wednesday. Oh, really? Yeah. And so why were you up there? Court issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As a youth. So wait, were you... You weren't in Dondale or anything, were you? No, I was. No. Oh, you were? Yeah. Oh, shit. For like nine months. What was that like? It was a little bit scary at the first part of it. It took a while for that to sink in. This young fellow that we were getting to know, a gentle soul, 
had just spent nine months, 15 hours up the road, in the infamous Dondale Youth Detention Facility. He says he felt pressured into crimes that landed him there. There's people, like, period, like, people, you know, like, they'll be with that forcing stuff, you know? Like, forcing you to do this, forcing you to do that. Mm-hmm. They'll bring that, like, B-word onto you. Oh, you little female dog, you know? Like, you're scared, you know, like that. And they'll, like, make it more tempting. But that's all behind me now. Yep. Yeah. In Dondale, Bison quickly learned to keep his head down. Did they even get rough with you? First times, but I, a little bit like a kind of them now, you know? Yeah. Because I'm a long way from home, that's what I was thinking. I had a spring a little bit long way from me. Yeah. Yeah. Is this right? Is this right way? Yeah, that's right. Small town, they got like different, different roads. Bison's story is a reminder of the importance of programs like All Rounder. And perhaps it wasn't a coincidence that Damien started the program around the same time Bison was sent to Dondale. Three generations of Arunda men, Dennis, Damien and Bison, somehow working together. The giant caterpillars that form the McDonald Ranges in Arunda culture can be seen in the distance. The Dreamtime stories are as beautiful as the landscape itself. But in 2024, the thought of what can happen to kids like Bison and the 10-year-olds that could serve time in the facility in which he just come from makes the beauty of the landscape and the people here ache that little bit more. Hello. Hello, hello. <laughs> Later, as the sun fell lower and the dust became redder, I was drawn by the side of Trimeria, Damien's youngest, just 13 months old. Blonde hair, olive skin, and a cheeky smile. <laughs> we would have dubbed her Creamy back on Yorta Yorta country. But this is her land, and it's where she's meant to be. Very good walking, very good walking. Dry. How long has she been walking for? She only just started. Yeah. She's good, look at her going. A couple of days now. Oh my gosh. As she toddles her way through the same dust her ancestors played in through the millennia, it reminds me that what we've seen during our time here are more her problems than anyone else's. Even though she's born into a loving family with strong role models and big hearts, the fact that she's born and will be raised on her land means she'll face a battle to become whatever she desires, a problem that children the same age but born elsewhere will never have. That is the great injustice of it all. And that's the heart of the problem at the heart of this country. Hi. This is Mbatwa. This is Alice Springs is written, reported and hosted by me, Daniel James. Ruby Jones co-reported and executive produced the series. Shane Anderson is our senior producer. Sarah McVee is our editor. Chris Dengate is our associate editor. Original compositions by Zoltan Fecho, mixing by Travis Evans. We had production support from Atticus Basto and Zaya Atangarau. Additional recording by Lloyd Barrett. This is Alice Springs was made on Arunda, Wiradjuri, Wurundjeri and Darawa land. Thanks to everyone who spoke to me on and off the record and welcomed me into their lives.